Hey everyone, this week on the 167, I get to interview Pastor Lucas, and we get to talk about movies, we get to talk about food, we get to talk about all the stuff that's going in our bodies that probably shouldn't be, and it is going to be a phenomenal week. We have another amazing seven-minute story for you, so make sure you stay tuned. Hey everybody, welcome to the 167. My name is Jake Reeves. I'm the creative arts pastor here at New Life and I'm sitting in for Pastor Lucas Motley because I made him change chairs because I was very jealous. And so Pastor Lucas is here joining us. Welcome Pastor Lucas Motley. I am sitting in for Pastor Rick George because he did not preach this weekend. Ah, and lastly, we're joined by Pastor Nick Magania. And I'm sitting in for Pastor Jake because he's sitting in for Pastor Lucas, who's just sitting in for Pastor Rick. So if you aren't watching this, I hope you had fun with that because you probably don't even think about where we sit, but we think a lot about it. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, I'm excited. Pastor Lucas preached the message this past week, um, which in a uh, classic Pastor Rick fashion, I want to be like, you did a phenomenal job. And so uh, we talked about the temple. We talked uh, about Jesus in the temple. And so with something like that, it gets big. It mm -hmm. gets a lot to cover. So my first question is always, what did you have to cut? What did you get to the end of the message? And you're like, ah, man, I really wanted to be able to cover that, but I didn't have time. Well, I mean, even in that second point, I said, like, you could spend a whole series there just talking about the parallels between what Jesus does in the temple and what Jesus does in his ministry, which was, you know, he he cast out things that weren't supposed to be there. He, um, you know, overturned these um, tables and everything. So most of what got cut is kind of the historical significance and what that would have meant to a Jewish audience. So, Oh, like the Ken Burns side of this. Yes. Slow moving photographs and mm -hmm. all the back end that you need. Yeah, just like, cool. it'd be like, and now welcome to the History Channel, and we're going to go, and we're like, no. No, the History Channel would have aliens in it. <laughs> that is and that's when the aliens built the temple in Jerusalem. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, we cut out the lizard people, and we cut out a bunch of stuff. But no, it was, it's, like, just the significance of that. Like, I spent a little bit of time on it, but the temple tax, I mean, you have to imagine Jews who, and, like, I, don't, I still don't even really understand how modern Judaism exists, where it's like, you know, the whole premise of Judaism was I sacrificed this animal in my place mm -hmm. of my sins and the shed blood is what covers me. Right. But they couldn't even do that back then. Like, I mean, like they're getting to the point where, yes, they're bringing in animals and they're sacrificing them, but they've got all these other things where it's like, well, now you have to bring the half shekel and you have to do two doves to, you know, gain access to the um, the temple. Like I said, we, I briefly touched on that. Like that was basically a way to keep women from worshiping because women were always having babies and so as soon as you had a baby you had to go sacrifice two doves in order to be able to come back and worship inside the temple so when they're hiking up prices on doves they're actually restricting access exclusively and specifically on women wow yeah. so are is modern day women in judaism are they bringing like dove soap in and like, <laughs> like dove soap and <laughs> what? No. some hamburger you know a couple of steaks this is a food drive but i mean like so. after that like i said judaism's never been the same like they yeah. sack the temple um, and so, you know, like they so said, they're like, it's taken 46 years to build this. And it's like, and you're going to be working on it for another 20 and then it's going to get burned to the ground. <laughs> so, uh, jumping over to you, pastor Nick. Um, so, because I'm not gonna let the guy who preached answer this first. So when you hear that Jesus is overturning things in our lives, he's casting things out. I know pastor Lucas talked uh, about, you know, Jesus forming the not Indiana Jones whip, um, but you know, driving the cattle out and everything. And, um, but that implies in our, or that actually is happening in our lives. What does that look like? Wow, that's a, that's a big question. <laughs> what, what does it look like? What, what, what does that look like, you know? <laughs> Nick didn't even sit in services. I'm just kidding. No, I, <laughs> don't throw me under the bus. I I was. No, that, you know, that's a great question. Um, you know, I think a lot of times it comes in little ways. You know, like Pastor Lucas was talking about, you know, the things that we watch. Like I was sitting there as you were talking about that, what are we ingesting and putting in our lives? And I was like, oh. 
oh, like, you know, am I consuming the things I should be consuming? You know, mm-hmm. I think God with, you know, like through other people speaking to you, like Pastor Lucas, or, you know, just the Holy Spirit speaking through your lives. There's a lot of times you just look at you like, oh, I'm not putting in the things of God. Like, this is just something that, like, it almost makes you sick when you look back at it. It's like the things that I've, you know, I ingested in the past. I'm like, oh, why did I used to be a fan of all these horror films and stuff? I'm like, yeah. why, why was that something that I, you know, desired in my life? It was something that God had to kind of purge out of me. And I think there's a lot of those things that we don't think about on a daily basis, but then when we actually start looking at them in the context of Scripture, we're like, oh, this isn't what God has for me. You know, this is something that's got to be driven out. Of. And a lot of times it's not the things we want to give up because it's the things we enjoy. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Were you guys, like, growing up, did, was that a staple for you guys as young Ben was like Freddy, Jason, like that whole gore scene or was it Oh Scream? Oh Scream, yeah. Oh, oh I know what you did but, last summer. So it was the yeah. the teeny bopper horror movies. No. A lot of those. The yeah. closest I ever got was scary movie. And that was <laughs> wow. like so I'm like, I don't understand this. What are they No, my uh, That's probably unwholesome from a different perspective. Yeah. No, my, my parents, uh, I'm pretty sure to this day if for some reason if I had the Simpsons on, they'd be like, Why are you watching this? So I mean, it's it's funny that the lines that people draw because I, I I also have a memory of watching Jurassic Park really early on in my life. But like, <laughs> I'm like, there are dinosaurs attacking people. Um, but no, mom and dad, you did a wonderful job raising me. I'm sorry. I'm not... <laughs> well, but I mean that comes up with us too with our kids because like uh, recently we were talking to them because they you're asking about shows that they can watch mm-hmm. and I just keep telling them you cannot unsee this. Yeah. Yep. Like it. It's, it's absolutely crazy because I know, um, so just recently, our, our daughter, she started, um, you know, she, she really hasn't consumed that much. We, we're not really much of a TV family, but we started letting her do some Sesame Street and Daniel Tiger. And all of a sudden, in the last two weeks, she started freaking out about shadows in her room. Or she's like, oh, like, uh, like, oh, there's a shadow there. And we're like, where are you getting this? Like, we don't talk about, you know, that you should be scared of set shadows or anything. Well, it turns out that there was a Daniel Tiger episode where Daniel is afraid of the, the shadows and he's being told there's nothing to be afraid of. And she's like, I didn't but know there was something I know, to be She's like, I was unaware. And so it's like, it's crazy. Something as unassuming as that uh, still, you know. Can introduce a fear. Yeah, absolutely. And so now we're like, well, I guess we're screening Daniel Tiger now. Oh, that's, so. that is the worst phase. Like, I have to do that with my girls where I'm like, I just have this rule where I'm like, as much as I can, there are some that I go to Common Sense Media right. and kind of look at the ratings for it. But most of it, they're like, can I watch this? And I'm like, that means that when you go to bed tonight, mom and I are going to stay up and watch, you know, like yeah. this show and go, oh, man. But I, I mean, I don't know if you're in the same boat I am. Like I said, it, it is. It's scary movies and things like that. For me, it was music, man. Like, oh, I, yeah. So much of my childhood growing up was concerts and, you know, live music and, you know, you know, my favorite bands. I was joking with you, like the, the first secular album I was ever allowed to own was Aerosmith Big Ones. Nice. <laughs> it was just like, and that was the first, I was probably 13 at the time. Up until that point, it was like Michael W. Smith and DC Talk and whatever. And it was like, I just fell in love with music. And then now I go back and I'm going, even if it's fairly, like I'd listen to stuff that was Dashboard Confessionals, Jimmy Eat World. So it's not real raunchy or anything like that but even then it's like you know i have to to weigh how much does this edify my spirit versus how much like because i instantly go into nostalgic mode i listen to that song and then i think about you know growing up and mistakes i made and you know like things like that that are happening in that that world at that time oh yeah i just have to figure out where's my where does this take me in my headspace yeah emo music for me man you know i was just a sad depressed kid from the middle of kansas some black hair in front of my face. If I grew up in the middle of Kansas, I would also be You know, that's, I'm like, that's half of it, is my parents were able to effectively uh, isolate me from the world because the internet only rolled in halfway through my adolescence. And (laughs) so, uh, God bless them. Um, So on really quick before, you know, we go a little bit deeper, I do want to kind of ask maybe a lighter question, but also it might lead to something else. So in this, we're referred to as the temple. which is obviously, as we're looking at Jesus physically, like he is in a temple doing these things, but then this is also something that we can look at in our own lives. Um, we've been called a lot in our lives. I mean, you can take that on however level you want. Uh, but scripture, you know, it calls us a temple, it calls us a bride, it calls us sheep, and so much more. My question is, 
I don't, let's see. We'll we'll jump here to to Pastor Nick. What's your favorite analogy for what you're referred to as in Scripture? Oh. Or what do you relate to most? Where you're like, oh man, that really speaks to me. It is weird, but uh, but almost like the bride of Christ is one that it speaks to me. Just being a husband and seeing the preparation, the, like in the thought that went into planning a wedding, and how much you know, you know, the value that my you know, that my wife put into it when she was picking out the dress and all those things. Mm. And then knowing from my side, you know, what it meant to me when I saw her walking down the aisle and mm. what that love was. And then if I magnify that by, you know, 10 million, because it's the love of God, if we are his bride, how much value does he place on me being his bride? Oh, yeah. See, listen, that's brilliant. Because I'm, I'm like sitting at, like thinking about the perspective of me and you're like, no, no, I identify with Christ and looking at my, I'm going... That is a way better answer than anything I was going to say. <laughs> How about you, Pastor Lucas? Um, yeah. I would I would say that same thing, but it depends on what phase of life I'm in. Like recently, it, it's that because um, I just think that it, it is. It's so powerful to talk about the way that you're loved. But there have been times in my life where, um, you know, I, I think that one of the most powerful parables is the parable of the lost son. Hmm. Because there have been times in my life where I've identified with the lost son and there have been times in my life where I identified with the brother that stayed. Like I've been, you know, self-righteous. I've been in a place where I'm judging other people and going, hey, I was the one that was sitting here doing the doing the right. good thing. And really, I wasn't doing the good thing. I'm, you know, <laughs> trying to impress people with my works or I'm being self, yeah. I'm acting self-righteously and I'm not showing mercy to my brother. And so I think that one's so powerful just because I can flip flop either way of saying either I'm the, you know, the son that stayed or I'm the the sun that's gone astray and feel far from God. What about you? Nice. Uh, I honestly actually really like the temple and I'm not just like, you know, buttering you up cause you preached on it. Um, oh, I didn't build the temple. Well, I know, yeah. <laughs> uh, which it, it's not directly in line with that, but I know like I did this big study, um, Zach, Wait, you mean the worship pastor likes the temple? I do. Oh, I uh, do. I'm sorry. This is a little cliche. Uh, there's a book called how to worship a King by Zach niece. Um, it's, I'm not gonna like raise it to like my second Bible, but it's it's. I love the way it's looking more at like the tabernacle and um, and and how we worship and how it mirrors things happening in that. Um, but I I just love I love the thought of of a temple because um, it it really hits to what you kind of wrapped up your message with, where you looked at like what what's the temple filled with, like what um, you know like. There's activity happening in a temple. There's, you know, there's cleansing, there's confessing, there's all these things. And so it's a very, um, and I mean this in a loving way, not, but it's a very mechanical view of ourselves, which as somebody who loves, I love to see how things work and stuff. And so um, temple for me is the non-romantic, um, and I'm not going to score points with my wife for that. You know, Carrie, meanwhile, is like, oh, my husband's the best, uh, you know? <laughs> Um, he loved our wedding day, and we we're like, I don't know, I like the sheep. I was like, now you know, the flip side is, I probably f identify more with being the sheep, the big stupid animal that's just wandering around getting lost. <laughs> well, that's why and I said doesn't it know was, what he's doing. I mean, <laughs> that was the great part of your answer is like, if I'm identifying with Christ, I'm like, ah, dang, that's so good. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But so, I I think that is, and like when you talk about things l left on the cutting room floor, I agree with you. The thing that I, I feel like got left on the cutting room floor is like Herod's temple. Like we kind of showed that a little mm -hmm. bit in Sunday morning it is so much different than the tabernacle. Right. <laughs> and so, because it's got all these business components to it, it's very Roman, and the tabernacle, when it was portable, you know, like you can take this wherever you want, like the tabernacle when it was portable was just the outer court where the sacrifices, or where people are coming to worship and get cleansed, the inner court where the sacrifices are happening, the showbread table, things like that, and then you had the Holy of Holies. There's nothing, like there's nothing else. It's just worship. It's a tent. It's pretty much outside. Like, yep. you know, it's this incredible, you know, just business time kind of, I'm here to worship. And then we pack it up and we move it with us and God dwells with us. And by the time you get to the temple, like, you know, there's a lot of, like they, they get in trouble at one point because they actually build the priests kind of homes. Yeah, right off. And that's, yeah, and then they, they're worshiping idols in their own home, and, but it's not in the temple court. And it just, it starts to, you know, they get a treasury, they get all this stuff, and it just starts to corrupt every, like you can see how it corrupts everything the more and more complicated it gets versus this like linen yeah. you know, tent where people are just coming to, to be with God out in the desert. Which there's got to be a message there just talking about like the simplicity and the mobility of the spirit 
resting with the Israelites in the tabernacle. And then, you know, when they start to get rigid, all this stuff starts to kind of seep in. And eventually we get Jesus. Yeah. And we get to be... Who the, is the temple temporarily and then we get right, to Right. Absolutely. Um, and so kind of looking, uh, if you're sending someone out um, from this and, you, you know, you talked a lot about what you're filled with, um, you know, that we shouldn't be filled with the world, that we should be filled with the spirit. We should be filled with prayer I, is actually the specific uh, language you used. Um, what are you hoping someone walked away with? What are you hoping someone um, does or that you're like, man, I hope they really latched on to boop, this? Um, I would say like kind of one of two things. One is kind of like what, what Nick was talking about where um, I don't want people to have condemnation, but I want them to have conviction. Mm. You know, like I think it's good for us. And I think that's true in marriages and in parenting, like where you have to kind of have a season of reevaluating. Like this worked for a little while and now it doesn't. And so I don't want people to go home and be like, I'm a terrible Christian. I want them to go home and say, what can I make, you know, how can I get better? You know, like you can say that like, not I'm a terrible husband, but how can I love my wife better? Yeah. Is there something small that I can do? And so that kind of thing, that evaluation of, of saying that, like going, oh, you know, like, yeah, you know, I watch a lot of, you know, like a show, you know, like Game of Thrones, like something like that where it's highly sexualized. There's not a lot of redeeming value in it. And it's yeah. like, and maybe I don't, like there have been, I remember I was, um, I jumped on the train. So here's confession time. I jumped on the Sons of Anarchy train for a while. Oh yeah, like, I watched I, a couple seasons of that. Yeah, yeah, and like, and it was, it was like, I got two seasons in and mm -hmm. I just, I was like, after a while, it, I just felt yeah dark. And uh, I was like, oh my gosh, I have I, to stop this. That was the same for me for The Walking Dead. Uh, oh, Sarah yeah. and I did that for a while. And then when we got off, uh, stopped watching, uh, I think we came back a couple years later and we're like, oh, we don't have the stomach we used to. Yeah. Um, yep. Yeah. It's but, so I think like just that of going, it's okay to stop. Yeah. Yeah. And then the, like you said, the other part with prayer and you guys correct me, like I have never seen growth in people in a relationship with God when they feel like they are hearing from God. Like when they feel like they can sit down and talk to God and they feel comfortable doing so. And when they feel like, yeah, I heard, I heard from the Lord, like I was praying and I just felt like this certainty that mm -hmm. I should go do this. And I knew that that was God. Like I see pe that light people on fire more than anything else in Christendom where it's yeah. like, they actually, they're like, I heard from God, you know, like right. going. So that house of prayer thing. And you know, like I said, and just some, some reevaluation of um, just small things. Like I said, you don't have to go live in the woods as a monk, but you know, what's something that you can but make more time for God. If that's your thing, you know, go live in the woods as a monk. I don't know. You guys ever read that stuff about like the monks that used to sit on, like, it was like, like a telephone pole. <laughs> No, no. There's this whole monastic order where they would go out in the woods and there's like a telephone pole, with a little platform on it. And they would just sit there. And so they had a bucket that where they would Wave. lower down and they'd put food in and they'd lower okay. it back up. Yeah, I was like, <laughs> where are like, we going with this you bucket? Going with this? <laughs> but then the bucket did come back down. I know. Oh my goodness. And there they just, two buckets. <laughs> they just meditated on a pole their whole lives. Is that, no, never mind. <laughs> so <laughs> let's steer a little bit into hopefully. <laughs> so don't do that. Yeah, maybe not. Uh, Pastor Nick, kind of, I know you're going to have a lot of overlap with that, but you know, we have a moment here with our, you know, children's pastor. How, as a parent, are you going to, how, how are you going to play this out as you not only have your own life, at, that's a temple, but you're watching little temples, you know, oh, little watching temples. little temples, <laughs> you're watching little temples Surely in your house. Temples. Can I start calling all the kids that coming into kids world? Hi, little temples, come in. Oh my goodness. <laughs> that would be <laughs> such like an old school. <laughs> I can't unthink that. Welcome now. to Thank Sunday you. school. <laughs> oh, little temples. <laughs> Gather around the upright piano, <laughs> and here we go. Oh, you Jesus just... loves the little children. You just ruined this for me. <laughs> <laughs> no, um, it is one of those things. I think it's the greatest you know, duty and calling a person has is to be a parent. You know, like, like when Pastor Cam and I were uh, speaking you know, a couple months ago mm -hmm. or whatever, we were in there talking about it. It's like the reality is God is not trusting us. Like It's not our children. It's God is trusting us with his children. Mm. So it's a stewardship thing. And so when you look at it in that context, it's, you know, what am I feeding? What am I putting into the minds of? What am I developing in the child of God? 
mm. you know, one of his very own children, you know, and would Jesus want me showing this to his kids? You know, it's really, in, you know, interesting. A lot of times we're more concerned about what we feed or let watch when we're watching someone else's kids than we are our own kids. Mm, good point. When we're babysitting for somebody else, we're very careful about the kid's diet and making sure it's not something their mom and dad doesn't want them to eat. We make sure that, you know, this is a movie that your mom and dad are going to be okay with, but we don't take that same view when we're raising our own kids, even though they're not our children, they're God's children. And yeah. we're just kind of like, oh, it's okay, it's our kids, so whatever we want goes. And it's like, but they're not. It's what does God want for those kids? It's, you know, we need to be taking that view. And I don't want to get like super, you know, legalistic with that, you know, and you, know, you can take that to a, a far end where it's like, we will show our children nothing of this world. You we know, are now and, Amish. Yeah, we are not, <laughs> we're, no, we're not going to have Disney. Sequestering ourselves you know, out in a commune. YouTube is the devil. I mean, kids at the same go time, sit in the flagpole. You know, I, th I think there is truth to that, though. Like, we were talking about that on Sunday where it's like, my body is not my body, it's God's temple. Mm -hmm. And, mm -hmm. you know, like that verse is like, I'm not my parent, I'm not my child's parent, I'm God's au pair. <laughs> you know, like, oh, um, nice. I am God's full time babysitter. Like yep. that's a way different approach to your kids than, you know, like you said, if I, if God gave me his kid, would I show him this? Yeah. I'm like, I'm like, ah, oh, that's so good. <laughs> if, I'm going to stop and buy more vegetables on the way home. If Pastor Jake gave me his child, would I feed her nothing but candy? Absolutely. Absolutely. <sighs> People yes. already do that on Sunday. <laughs> so much candy. She is so angry by the time we get <laughs> home because we don't let her have it all. Uh, but she has a supply for the rest of the week. So, you know. When she ends up with diabetes because she's a faithful church attender. <laughs> the diabetes. <laughs> so what about you then? What do you like if yeah. you're taking a practical step of a if you can encourage somebody? Uh like I, I think on the the side of that, which which I think the challenge that we're in is a great um example of that. You know, we've we talked a lot about the stuff that we're convicted that we shouldn't be putting in, but let's talk about filling it with prayer, mm -hmm. filling it with uh, you know, filling it with scripture, filling it with podcasts, filling it with Kirk Cameron movies, Kirk Cameron movies, pure flicks. Um, you know, and, and I think, I think back even to when I was in, uh, you know, Bible college and I was in youth ministry and, um, uh, my professor, he, he was a pretty big advocate of not sequestering from the world, but he was definitely a big fan of when you go out, have, be processing, like be processing. So when you're watching a movie, you're not just shutting your brain off. You're literally looking, what's the worldview happening here? What's, um, granted, it means you don't quite get as much of the like, I'm gonna shut my brain off, but you don't honestly see a lot of edicts in uh, scripture and, and thou shalt shut thy brain off. <laughs> you know, it calls for sobriety and it calls, cool. um, yeah. but all that to say, like, I think choosing to put things in our life, which is what the challenge is doing, why there's something uh, that's driving us to scripture, that's driving us to action, that's driving us um, to to not just say, these aren't the things I'm going to put in my life, um, because you better believe that my wife leaned over to me and mentioned a show right when you were like, you know, it's about what you're putting in. I'm like, and she's like, well, maybe not this. I'm like, dang it, Sarah. Stop it. That's the thing. Like, Stop we're, it. <laughs> we're not great at, like, we're not great at saying, at denying ourselves. Yeah. Like, as Christians, a lot of times, we're not great at denying ourselves. Like, we want to to partake in everything that we want to partake in that the world wants to partake in, but then also say that we're different. I and it, know. it's just a, it's a really hard road to cross because like you said, how do you not withdraw from culture and yet not desire to just be the nicest person in culture? And I love pop culture. Mm -hmm. Like mm -hmm. my, one of my favorite things growing up was, you know, spoof movies, spoof t and, but you have to know pop culture to get the reference. And so like, I love stuff that does that. But at the same time, is that honestly edifying any part of my life? No, it's really not. Um, it's me just, you know, it's feeding the flesh. It's really not really doing anything. Well, it's so like, it's just like you said, it's, we can do this in our bodies really easily because anybody would tell you, it's not just about starving yourself. Mm. It's about changing your palate to like things that are like, instead of wanting the candy bar, I want to eat the piece of fruit because this actually tastes good and my, Oh, yeah. my, my body starts to crave it, like changing your diet to not yep. just abstaining from things, but mm -hmm. actually in a different direction is a, is a whole different fundamental ball game. Yep. Cause you're, you're going to, you're going to experience fail, failure if all you're trying to do is abstain and you're not, you know, not taking in yeah. good things. Yep. So any last 5%? 
Pastor Lucas? I don't know. We haven't done a movie quote. We really haven't. We, and But the thing is, Nick would probably have seen the movie where our typical thing is Pastor Rick will be like, I have no idea what you guys are talking about. So <laughs> It's like in The Hobbit when they had second breakfast. No. Oh. You can't just abstain from second breakfast. You have to want lunch. I don't know. I know. But terrible. what about second tea? Mm, I don't like tea. All right. Well, excellent conversation today, gentlemen. Thank you so much for joining us today on the 167. There's going to be a little bit more coming around. Make sure you're staying tuned. We love you guys. Have a great, great day. Hey, welcome to 7 Minute Stories here on the 167, and I'm here with Dan. Hello. Dan, how are you doing? Pretty good. How about you? Good. So you wanted to come in and share something powerful that has happened in a relationship with your cousin, right? Yes. So her name is Kimber, right? Yep, Kimber Lane. All right. Why don't you tell me a little bit about her, right? We're going to put seven minutes on the clock. All right. And you can just tell me a little bit about what God's doing in that situation and what happened. So what did come... I would like to address, like, the storyline first. So how did Kimber come into the life? Kimber was uh, from Guatemala in 2005. Her mom placed her up for adoption because of poverty. Mm -hmm. So Kimber was coming to the U.S. to be adopted by a family through a agency in Kansas City. And uh, the adoption fell through, but she was brought to Kansas City to place in a temporary home. She was 11 months old, mm -hmm. and they finally... Uh, they, she had a diagnosis around that time, yeah, right? Yeah, so arriving in the States, she was diagnosed with cerebral palsy. Sorry, I'm bad at saying that. And aut autism and nonverbal autism. Mm. So through the series of unusual circumstances, my aunt and uncle met Kimber. And when they did, she fell in love with her and wanted to adopt her. She was welcomed by my aunt and uncle, thankfully, and her four brothers and sisters. Are you about her age? Yes. So she was 16 when she died last winter around the winter time so sadly she passed but uh she was uh closest cousin to me so you know how every family has cousins mm -hmm. that are close to each other uh, i had her and it was pretty cool because once we see somebody special like us two we uh go to each other and just know we're brothers and sisters it's like following through christ you know we're brothers and sisters but in our gut, it tells us we're brothers and sisters. Well, I know that you you yeah. have a, a diagnosis of, of autism as yes, well, right? Yes, high functioning autism. Yeah, and it was. Yes. I thought that was amazing. I watched yeah. you work at VBS because there was a young boy that came in with autism yes. as well, and you were able to recognize that. And and yes. I remember that because you said, "Man, can I just be his buddy?" Yeah. And it was so helpful because you would walk around with him and say, "Hey, here's what he here's what he's asking for. Here's what he wants." Yeah, I wasn't really thinking about that. I would find somebody like that at the VBS camp because he was in kindergarten. I was working with games. I didn't even expect it. And the first two days, he every single time he saw me, he would just hug me. I'm mm -hmm. like, "This is my brother right here through Christ and through us." Yeah. So it was pretty cool. I got to work with him for the rest of the week, one on one, and I was thankful that I was there and other people were there too, because they got to learn from me how to take care of them. Yeah, that was extremely so, helpful. Yeah. As somebody who doesn't always understand yeah. that relationship, and yeah. so you had that same relationship with your cousin Kimber that yes. you know you both had autism and you felt that bond. You yes. know, you were close. Yeah. And so um, you said that she passed away January of 2021, right? Yeah. And she sadly had a stomach virus kind of thing. But yeah. 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 But so when that happened, what was, you know, you had come to me at that time too and was talking about different things that, that had happened in that situation yeah. that the Lord was ministering to you or yes. during the funeral. Yeah. Can you tell me a little bit about that? So what was the question again? Sorry. Um, just like what was what were some of the God moments in that? Well, it was really weird because some of the god moments i i wasn't really there close when she passed away and stuff mm -hmm. but whenever we met her she was always so kind and she had a smile on our her heart every almost every single time i saw her almost every single time i saw her she was smiling there's only been like one or two different times throughout my life 
And when I got to see her, she wasn't smiling. And she had so much wrong. She was in a wheelchair. She couldn't verbalize and everything. And she was happy all the time. So it was pretty crazy because I learned from that. That's why I'm normally a happy, upgoing guy. I learned it from her. I, we just all should learn because uh, there's a, we all struggle, but there's always somebody with more struggles and a harder life. we got to remember that. So we got to stay positive and stay uplifting to help that other person. Well, you and I have talked about that a couple of times yeah. where you say that's kind of your way to honor her, right? Yes, very is much to, so. Is to spread that kind of joy and happiness because yes. she was such a happy individual. Yes, sir. Yes. Well, that's very fantastic. So. Yeah. What do you think that that happiness came from? I really don't know. I think it's partly through God because it was another story. It was weird because almost every single time she went to church, she would be dead silent. And it was crazy for her especially because I think whenever she was out and about, she'd always yell and scream. Mm -hmm. And she loved it. She was just having fun listening to her music and yelling and screaming. It sounds bad, but she was really singing in her own way. And I think it was to have people laugh at her and stuff, not intentionally, but to just have fun with it. She noticed people were laughing, and that made her happy. Mm -hmm. It was all about ha happiness, I but think. But she'd come to church, and she was still yes. peaceful? silent. That's awesome. Yeah, and it was pretty cool because I think it was six months before she died, uh, she had her first communion in the Catholic Church, was, which was amazing. And instead of just giving her the bread and stuff, they actually taught her about saying amen and stuff. And I think uh, when she they were leaving the building, she actually said, awesome, awesome, yes, on her talker. That's really cool. After she was blessed in the communion. So we knew that she was going to heaven. So, That's yeah. good. So one of the questions that you had talked about a little bit is how you felt about what your aunt and uncle did in adopting her and how you feel about adoption in general. Do you want to tell us a little bit about that? Yes, so I really liked it. Um, sorry. Uh, I really liked it because she, my family, my aunt and uncle were so open about it. And it, I, she, sorry, I'm losing train of thought. That's okay. <laughs> Take your time. They opened up their hearts and gave her everything they had. Also, so did her brothers and sisters. I was so thankful about Because sometimes in those situations, brothers and sisters don't want to give up their family for outcast kind of thing. But they opened they up They feel their, like they're taking up yeah. so much of their time yeah. away from their parents. Yeah, and it's just amazing how they opened up. Their actions inspired me to be so much more selfless. Like, I noticed I need to share my love from them and what they did to Kimber to more people. Well, I think I can see that evident in your life because you're always yes. showing up before a youth group and helping set up. Yes. You're always someone who's quick to share. You're always someone who's quick to help out. Yes, I, I love to do that. And um, also forgiving people. Equality, no matter how special is their special needs, skin color, or whoever they are. So that's a big piece. They didn't care that she was female. They didn't care that she was special needs. They didn't care about her race. Uh, she, they treated like anybody. So did my mom. It was crazy. Um, we actually didn't skip this part, but it was crazy because they had caregivers that mm -hmm. they needed breaks sometimes and they had to work and stuff. So they would have caregivers and caregivers were amazing that they had. And they made sure to find the right ones. And one of them was my mom. And I'm so blessed and thankful that she was able to do that. She was an awesome caregiver. Everybody will agree with that. And she gave, saved, she always saved hugs for special people. And she, I noticed she gave her some of the best hugs ever to my mom. And that was really cool. And it's just, crazy to know that my mom was able to help her out just like I would want to too. That's great. Yeah. Do you have any last minute advice? Um, Cause I know that's a very special yeah. issue for you about how to treat people with autism. Uh, I say, well, I made this saying up by myself, but it's take, treat us the same, but care for us more. 
-hmm. So it might just treat us like the same as a normal human being and just treat us like anybody else, equality again. And once you do that, it might take some harder work to get in a conversation with us. It takes a lot of patience. I have trouble being patient around my fellow brothers and sisters. It's hard. And you just have to slowly take it baby steps pretty much and try to have a conversation with them. And yeah, so you have to slowly take it and just patience is key. Well, thanks for bringing that to our attention. And like I said, I'm I'm really proud of you. I know we all are here of, like I said, you've taken that and you've always been joyful, always have a sense of gratitude about you. And you even brought that, like I said, to help us be better at caring for for people in your situation as well through VBS and through other things. So thanks for coming on and telling your seven minute story. That's Thank thank you so much for having me. It was so much fun. No problem. Hey guys, thanks for joining us here on seven minute stories. We'll see you next time. Thank you. If you enjoyed this episode of the 167, make sure you like, subscribe, follow, get notified, leave a five-star rating and a positive review. Tell all your friends to listen as well. Make sure you go over to newlifegardener.com and check out all that we have to offer as a church and check out our messages online as well. Thanks for listening.